Welcome to Smart Talk, where we speak with leading academics and other thoughtful persons on the important challenges facing the world today. My name is Edward Dodson. I am a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School of Social Science. Our guest today on Smart Talk is Nicholas Tiedemann. He has taught economics at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University since 1973, joining the faculty of Virginia Tech after an appointment as an assistant professor at Harvard University, during which he took a year out to serve as a senior staff economist at President Richard Nixon's Council of Economic Advisors. Professor Tiedemann earned his undergraduate degree in mathematics and economics from Reed College, then a doctorate in economics from the University of Chicago. One might say that he was born to pursue economic research and to become a member of the discipline. From the 1890s on, members of his family over four generations have been strong supporters of the movement for economic reform initiated by Henry George. Nick learned about Henry George's thinking from his father, who said to him when quite young, isn't it strange that some people think they can own land? Nick has been a leading voice within the economics discipline, urging his colleagues to examine with objectivity the role played by land market dynamics and the private appropriation of the rent associated with locational advantages. During the 1990s, he played a key role in an effort to convince the new regime in Russia not to follow the Western pattern of allowing the nation's land and natural resources to be privatized. I was fortunate enough to join Nick on one of the many trips made to Russia in this effort. Sadly, those we worked with in Russia did not have the power to implement the reforms necessary to change the course of Russia's history. The list of Nick's writings on important economic, social, and political issues is too long to try to list. Smart Talk reviewers are directed to his university website and to the many other papers readily available by a simple internet search. I'm anxious to hear from Nick what he has to say about the state of the US and world economy today and about his ongoing research interests. Nick, welcome to Smart Talk. Thank you. It's really great to have you here. Uh, we've known each other for a long time uh, and uh, I've always valued your input on some of the real important issues of our day, but Today, I'd like to ask you to start off by sharing with the Smart Talk audience something of your family's involvement in the single tax movement and how this brought you to economics as your chosen profession. Well, my great grandfather, Sven, uh, came to the United States from Sweden knowing no English. And he went to Chicago where there were lots of other Swedes and he asked another Swede what would be a good way to learn English. And that person replied that he should read Henry George. And that's how it happened that uh, our, my family uh, has been interested in Henry George's ideas for four generations. Uh, I believe that somewhere on the web, perhaps on your website, uh, one can find a copy of my great grandfather's book, Radicalia. That is um, exactly true. <laughs> my grandfather, uh, left school at the eighth grade to support the family, but nevertheless became an electrical engineer by taking courses at the YMCA. Mm -hmm. He became chief uh, electrician of the city of Chicago and was uh, one of the founders of the Henry George School of Social Science in Chicago in the early 1930s. Uh, my father studied electrical engineering at the University of Illinois, uh, but then left electrical engineering to work for his brother-in-law at the Henry George School in Chicago, and then revived the Henry George School in San Francisco. So uh, I'm uh, from a long line of people who have taken an interest in Henry George's ideas. And how early in your life were you interest, introduced to Henry George and were yeah. you asked to read Progress in Poverty at a young age? Uh, I don't believe I read Progress in Poverty until I graduated from high school. Uh, but my father 
explained to me that the factors of production were land, labor, and capital, and that their returns were rent, rent wages, and interest when I was about eight years old. And I remember another lesson in economics when we were riding on a streetcar in San Francisco, and as we passed the chicken parts store, I asked my father, how can they survive in business? Don't people just buy the drumsticks? And he took the Socratic method and asked, well, suppose you ran the chicken parts store and you noticed that you ran out of drumsticks and everything, you had lots of anything else. Can you think of anything you could do to make sure that things would run out at the same rate? And he gradually extracted from me the idea that there had to be a set of relative prices at which the parts would be bought by customers at just the ratios at which they were found on the chicken. So that was my first lesson in economics. I would say. <laughs> oh my goodness, at such a young age too. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously the the early lessons stuck with you. Uh, you went on to pursue a degree in economics and to You've taught it for all these years. So I guess the, you know, the follow-up question I would ask you is, as a professor of economics, over all these decades, have you seen the level of interest in Henry George's proposals and his analysis shift, either for the betterment or, you know, is, it, is Henry George still, in your mind, part of the sort of underworld of economics? Well... I think that uh, 40, 50 years ago, there was more knowledge of Henry George's ideas than there is today. Hmm. Uh, I encounter young economists who have no idea that land might be different from capital. Uh, whereas uh, in 1991, when I was circulating uh, the letter to Gorbachev suggesting that they uh, retain the rent of land for public purposes in Russia. Uh, there were any number of prominent economists in their 60s and 70s who uh, were quite familiar with the idea and supportive of it. So I, I think that uh, it, it, it has declined, but it might possibly be coming back. Uh, I think that people are now more ready to think about the possibility that there is a common heritage in natural opportunities. Well, that may be encouraging. I, I think certainly the, the kind of attendance we're getting at the Henry George School in terms of the lectures that are provided online is pretty encouraging. And even in my own teaching in senior adult education elsewhere, uh, I'm finding a significant increase in the level of interest in alternative explanations for how the world works, that there's general dissatisfaction with what's being told to people by the media and by the media economists that we you know, often hear. So perhaps uh, we are on the, the beginning part of an upswing in, in interest, in, and hopefully that means that... Uh, your writings will get even more attention as the next couple of years come, come and go. Well, I'm reminded of that quote from Sinclair Lewis you might be familiar with. It's hard for man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Yes. And I think that if one substitutes wealth for salary, it's even more understandable. I think that uh, just as people who called themselves owners of slaves couldn't understand why slavery was wrong. People who uh, put their wealth in the form of net, the ownership of land can't understand why that could be wrong or have a hard, very hard time with it. it, it I think you're, you're onto something there that those of us who achieve a level of perceived expertise in whatever our profession is, uh, we have a hard time accepting that we might have missed something very critical to the analysis of the work that we do. And it does take a, a big person to admit that. Um, I often wonder in reading Henry George's Science of Political Economy, where he takes on John Stuart Mill very seriously and over many, many pages, what Mill's response would have been had he, been still, had he still been alive. 
Well, I think that among economists who are specialists in public finance, there's no uh, questioning of the idea that a tax on land doesn't have the deadweight loss, the excess burden, the inefficiency of other taxes. But they just don't find that worth uh, attending to. They don't seem to see it as part of a systemic reform. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, if they begin to think about it, they think well, it's so politically impossible to imagine succeeding in that direction that it's not worth thinking about. Yeah. Well, certainly those of us who've been advocates for land value taxation over the many de decades have experienced how difficult it is to find uh, a political uh, voice for the idea, and then even when it's adopt, adopted, to keep it in place, uh, as occurred in, in the city of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully that that will that will is in the process of changing, and hopefully your work will help contribute to that in the political arena. But but let me ask you then, as you you know you. As you went through your degree program, as you studied mainstream economics, and you had this background understanding of Henry George's analysis of political economy, what did you see as different, as a, as a philosophical foundation within the George's paradigm that persuaded you that George was really onto something? Well, the philosophy prof profession has come closer to providing a foundation in the economics profession. In philosophy, there is a emerging tradition known as left libertarianism. Yeah. And left libertarianism is really uh, a fancy way of uh, describing Henry George's perspective or something very close to it anyway. Uh, there are various flavors of left libertarianism, but the fundamental assumptions of left libertarianism are first, that people have rights to themselves, and secondly, that all people have equal rights to natural opportunities. And that, it seems to me, is exactly what Henry George was saying. So I think that left libertarians recognize Henry George as somebody who was one of them. I... Uh... I, I obviously came across a term that, that equates somewhat to left libertarianism, and that's cooperative individualism. And as you may know, the history of that term comes from the uh, founding documents of Fairhope, Alabama. And I first heard about it from Paul Gaston uh, giving a lecture in Fairhope. And at the time, he was a uh, professor of history at the uh, University of Virginia. So... I, I, I immediately grasped that cooperative individualism was what Henry George was aiming for. Uh, how, do we, how do we maximize individual liberty within a cooperative societal framework? And uh, perhaps, perhaps the left libertarians will eventually realize that the cooperative individualism is, is what they're really aiming for. Uh when did the term cooperative individualism arise? Oh, you, in the founding documents of Fairhope, which was really the 1890s or so. Correct. Yes. Now, of course, whether or not, uh, I don't know, I haven't traced the origins of the term itself. I don't, I don't know if E.B. Gaston and the other founders of Fairhope uh, came to it on their own or came to it out of you know, some other uh, knowledge that they had. But, but I, I've, I found it as a term that's relatively easy for people to understand and hopefully uh, will eventually grasp the significance of this idea of, of, that Henry George has provided to us of, as you say, we have rights to ourselves and we have rights to uh, uh, natural opportunities. So... Your, your most recent uh, writing and, and research activity 
Have you been focusing on the philosophical implications of George, or are you are you focusing more on the technical uh, implications? Well, I'm concerned equally with both. I think. I think that for many people, uh, having a well developed uh, philosophical foundation is an important component of what makes an idea understandable to them. And at the same time, there's uh, an important question of whether it's feasible. I think there are many people who can't imagine the possibility of separating the value of land from the value of improvements. And so uh, demonstrating that there are reasonable ways of doing that is part of what needs to be done. Uh, so I, uh, on the one hand, I understand that uh, assessors have been doing it for generations, perhaps centuries. On the other hand, I think it's interesting to uh, explore new ways that uh, markets might be used to uh, identify the separate value of land buildings. Can you expand on that a bit? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, one way to dis determine the value of land is just to uh, have the assessors go out and uh, buy some properties, remove the improvements, and then auction them off under terms to specify that the value for tax purposes is going to be whatever the, they sell for at auction. And uh, th through this process, one can imagine developing a land value map through the idea that land values are continuous. And yet there may be places in the downtown areas where it just isn't cost effective to find uh, places where you can knock buildings down or where you would like to know what a property would be worth if you could get a whole square block when it's divided up into separate properties. And you might want to ask, how can you be fair to the owners of the separate properties while also requiring them to uh, take responsibility for preventing somebody from owning the whole block and if that is the efficient way that it could be owned. So I developed the idea of an options market where you have people who would like to redevelop land specify how much they would pay for an, uh, a plot of given size uh, as a function of location in, in, a smooth, in terms of a smooth function. Uh, and then also uh, allow people to uh, have tax bills that are less than the uh, value on, in the option uh, if they're prepared to sell at a lower price. So I, I, I work out this, this idea of a kind of a game in which different people play different roles. And what emerges is uh, a land value map and uh, a set of tax bills uh, without having to knock down any 20 story structures in order to find out what, what the value of the bare land would be. And in that simulation, do you expect that there would be a robust market reaction in, in favor of adopting that, those, that, that those measures? Uh, or you haven't gotten that I, far I think I, I have to plead um, comparative advantage. Uh, I don't have a, a, the particular skill of uh, marketing ideas. Uh, I, I develop the ideas and leave it up to others to market them. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that, I mean, the challenge, of course, you know, land value taxation is such a beautiful idea because it can be implemented over time. And so every year that you change the rates, you shift the rates off of buildings and onto land values, you, you can see the, the uh, market reaction, whether or not there is an increase in investment 
in new construction or property you know, rehabilitation. But the difficulty always comes to that point when the annual tax payment on the land value has reached something close to its full potential rental value. And now the system has to revert from the, the use of assessment, capital assessments to a, a land rental assessment. Uh, would you well, agree? Let me that comment that's the... on that. Yes. Okay. Um, a land value tax could be a tax on the sale value or on the rental value. And uh, as you indicate, um, if you tried to collect all the rent from a tax on the sale value, the sale value would go to zero. So where, where's your tax base? On the other hand, it's rather difficult to observe land rents. I spent about 10 years trying to figure out what land rent was from a theoretical perspective when you have a land piece of land where you would do something different with it each year depending on when it was vacant and ready for reconstruction uh how, how do you decide what the rent is when it, when you'd use it differently uh depending on when you started using it uh, after pondering that for many years, I realized that the answer was rather simple, that the rental value of land is the opportunity cost of leaving vacant land vacant. Now, let me elaborate on that. You could ask, if you had a piece of vacant land today, what is the present value for all future time of the opportunity to use that land? That's the sale value. Now you can ask, suppose that you have it vacant today, but somebody says, wait, I'd like to use it for a parking lot for a year, and then you can have use of it. By what amount does the dollar value of the use of it fall if you have to wait a year before you start using it? That is the rental value of the land for this year. But that's the only rental value that makes sense uh, in, in that when you have that definition, the rental value for all the future years adds up to the sale price. So it was a, a great revelation to me to be able to specify what rental value is. But then there is another important insight, which is that there's no upper limit on the tax you can have on the sale value. Let me you might think that the a tax of 100% is as much you could have. But if you think about it, a tax of 2% per year is 200% per century. So you, are, it's, you have to specify the time period before you know really what a, a, a tax on the sale value is. And if you can have a tax of 2% per year, you can have a two, tax of 2% per a month, 2% per week, 2% per day, 2% per hour. In the limit as the interval over which you collect 2% goes to zero, you collect something that approaches mathematically 100% of the rental value of the land. So if you're content to collect only 99.99999% of the rent, you can do so by a tax on the sale value. You just have to collect the rent often enough. <laughs> you have to collect a, a share of the sale price often enough. So I think that we probably don't want to collect absolutely all the rent. We want to have the land have some uh, sale value so that people will have an incentive to uh, clear uh, derelict de de buildings off of it if buildings are no longer useful. Uh, and it's interesting that Henry George didn't specify exactly what kind of a share of the sale price he was thinking of in terms of a, a tax on land value. Uh, so I think that a tax of maybe 20% per year would be about right. So mm -hmm. a, a, a piece of land would sell for a five years rent. And would, yeah. I mean, would, would that be sufficient to uh, curtail speculation in land. Uh, well, so if you, let's say that the interest rate is 5%. If the interest rate is 5%, then a tax of 20% per year 
will collect 80% of the rent of land. It's uh, 20 over 20 plus five is the ratio of the rent that it collects. And I think that if there were a tax collecting 80% of the rent of land, there would be very few opportunities uh, to speculate in land that would, would pay. You, you'd find people uh, always looking for some way of disposing of land rather than uh, pay the tax on it when they couldn't use it. Well, I think that's really useful analysis. And I hope that, that we'll find some, uh, some elected officials who are concerned about yeah. tax policy listening into this interview and our well, discussion. Let me mention another thing that this reminds me of. Uh, many people are concerned about the possibility of driving uh, business people into bankruptcy by requiring them to pay a land tax when they're already paying a mortgage. And that has led me to embrace an idea that I learned from Michael Hudson, which is that we should regard the holder of a mortgage as the collector of the rent and the person to whom we should go to collect a tax if we want to collect the rental value of land for public purposes. So I would say that when there is a mortgage on property, if the value of the mortgage exceeds the value of the improvements, then the mortgage holder is declaring himself to be the rightful recipient of the rent to that extent, and therefore the rightful recipient of the tax bill if we want to collect the tax for public purposes. Well, as a, as a former mortgage lending officer in the banking community, uh, I have some concerns about, about Michael's proposal. And you know, without getting into a long discussion, we could have a whole hour on this particular question alone, I think. Um, what always bothers me is, is the fact that the primary beneficiary of the proceeds of the sale of that property are no longer involved in this discussion. Um, you know, so the mortgage lender, or per, more appropriately, the mortgage investor, because in most cases, the loans that are made by banks and mortgage brokers are sold into the secondary market to you know, some private holder pension fund or could yeah. be Fannie Mae or Fran Freddie Mac, et cetera. So those investors have to go into the credit markets to acquire the funds in order to uh, purchase the mortgage loans. And yes, so I, I would, uh, well, so to do, I would regard the intermediaries as intermediaries and capable of passing the rent bill on to the people for whom they borrow. So uh, to elaborate, I understand you have a special sensitivity on this matter, but nevertheless, <laughs> to elaborate on my proposal, uh, I, I would say that uh, it's suitable for rentiers, people who are trying to uh, get a return on their investments without any risk at all to say that they are going to be disappointed that we found a way to require them to contribute uh, to the financing of public activity to the extent that they are counting on receiving the rent of land uh, it, as uh, an investment return. Uh, so the title holder uh, would be responsible first for the taxes on the land and to the extent that the tax represents a levy on uh, debt, the uh, owner of would be allowed to uh, use his tax receipts as a payment for his loan obligation to say, mm -hmm. look, this is really your tax bill and I paid it for you. See, here's the receipt. And then the intermediary receiving that receipt would be to say, I know you were expecting uh, a, 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 an interest payment on that obligation we have, but it turns out that the, that interest is being taxed and we paid the tax and here's the receipt to prove it. And this would go on and on uh, to the ultimate recipient of the, uh, the income. 
Well, I suspect there'll be a number of very thoughtful people who, who will view and listen to this interview and think about what you've just told us. Um, I, I need to think more deeply about the possible uh, outcomes and, and impact on, on various participants in that, in that whole uh, okay. you know, market well, level. Perhaps we can discuss this more offline. Yes, or I could. I'd love to read a your paper that that really describes it in detail, and perhaps others would as well. well. Let's okay. So so we've talked about basically the real estate market and land value taxation, but Henry George uh, has written about rents as in a much more broader sense, and certainly you've had an interest in how this analysis applies to copyrights and patents. So I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to hear your take on what, if any, limits there ought to be to the protections that individuals receive under the law, under copyright and patent law. And do you well, think the current laws are fair or should they be revised? I think it's interesting to look at Henry George's uh, developments of ideas on the subject. In his initial uh, writing, he thought that both copyright and patent were unjust. And then he changed his mind and decided that patents were unjust, but copyrights were not because they didn't uh, infringe on the opportunities of others to do what they were going to do. Uh, from a mathematical perspective, uh, you might say that a copyright uh, has uh, a zero measure with respect to how much it reduces uh, the opportunities of others. Now, I'm inclined to think that that isn't quite right. Uh, I'd like to illustrate my ideas first with the song Happy Birthday. <laughs> now, uh, it's not surprising that in a culture there will be some song that people sing to commemorate happy uh, a person's birthday and it just happens to be that it's the happy birthday song that we all know. Now, that song began as uh, a tune written by a Texas teacher to the words, good morning to you, good morning to you, good morning, dear teacher, good morning to you. Uh, and was that song copyrighted? Well, there's questions about that. It, it <laughs> appeared here and there. Uh, somebody claimed the copyright to it. But eventually, in the last 10 or 20 years, course decided that the person who thought he had a copyright had only a copyright to a particular arrangement of the song and that the tune itself was in the public domain. And all the uh, royalties that had been paid by restaurants who had had their staff sing happy birthday or and all the publications where happy birthday was sung and a royalty but was paid were legally incorrect, that there was no royalty that needed to be paid on happy birthday. So <clears throat> uh, I think it is important to uh, reward creators of uh, copy as well as creators of ideas that are patented in, in some way, because we do greatly benefit from their efforts. Uh, but I think that monopoly is the wrong way to reward them. Uh, I think we should have prizes for people who come up with valuable ideas and prizes for people who come up with uh, works that are widely downloaded. Uh, but I think it isn't necessary to give huge awards to the lucky few who uh, happen to land on something that they that's worth a lot more than they could have imagined. I think that we would be better off uh, if we uh, made uh, the creation of ideas something that uh, wasn't a uh, a treasure hunt so much as a, a way of making a reasonable living if uh, you produce something that others find valuable. Benjamin Franklin seemed to have that idea that, that these good ideas should be shared with the world. 
he never never attempted to patent any of his inventions. Um, it, there's the logic that I've read, I, and I think it, it's a fair logic that you have teams of people all over the world working to solve very important, significant problems, and we reward the one who got there, gets there to the finish line first. And maybe only by a few minutes before the second person. Yeah. And so, how do we? How do yeah. we? How do I we remember deal with hearing that? the story. I wish I could verify that it's true. That as Alexander Graham Bell walked out of the patent office, having just filed his patent, somebody was walking in yeah. with another phone to, telephone to be patented. Uh, so uh, the, the, it seems to me that. Uh, patents, even under the existing rules, are given much too often for things that are just ready to be invented by anybody. And uh, we we really don't need to create more monopolies. Uh, the, the, all these monopolies interfere with uh, productive uh, advances in our, our uh, technology. With regard to copyright protections, what what's your view about the quote fair use doctrine that's pervasive with material that's shared on the internet? I think it should be greatly expanded. I think that uh, it makes sense to me to uh, limit the capacity of people to simply publish what somebody else has already published, but of, for making individuals who want to make individual copies, it seems to me that that uh, ought to be allowed. And uh, similarly, I think that if people want to build on somebody else's copyrighted work or to alter it in some way, uh, I remember reading that the writer of Waiting for Godot has specified that it can never be performed in uh, in a setting in which roles are taken by people with gender other than specified in the original mm. text. And it seems to me that is giving the author just too much control, that we should be allowed to take these ideas and play with them in whatever way we want as soon as they are out there. It is a rather complicated issue, particularly today with the, you know, the internet and the ability to download material. I mean, I do it every day, all the time. Yes. And, and I, my feeling is, particularly with, with articles and papers, that while the author might find an original publisher and have a limited reading, that by putting that material online elsewhere, it's giving the author a much larger audience than the author would otherwise reach. Yes. Uh, I think that when we publish things as we now do, it's an inefficiently expensive process. There is a worthwhile activity of curating, of uh, identifying things as worth reading. Uh, and it, it seems to me that we have to get away from combining that with uh, putting them down on pieces of paper, that we should find some way to do the curation efficiently uh, without ha having to print in order to do it. Well, another really important, you know, uh, topic with a lot of legal implications and you know one one i would love to move on to if if i can with you is to talk a little bit about the implications of um, uh, tax policy necessary to deal with the climate crisis uh, in particular the big debate over whether or not it makes sense to have a carbon tax or is the carbon trade uh, market a suitable substitute? Well, uh, let me postpone that for just a couple minutes while I answer a prior question. Okay. I was reading in The Economist recently that there are 
people who say that a carbon tax will never do the job, that it can't possibly substitute for uh, adding the new technologies that we need. And I believe that the economist correct was correct in saying that it's possible that that's true, but even if it is true that carbon taxes won't do the whole job, uh, it's important to add them to whatever else we do. Doing other things does not uh, relieve us of the need to do something with carbon taxes. Uh, And here, I'm willing to begin by assuming that either carbon taxes or a carbon trading market uh, could do the job. The, the, it seems to me pretty clear that either one could do the job. Uh, or part I, of the for, job? What? The, part, of, well, the, part, of, part of the job. The part, yeah, the, 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 each could contribute to mm -hmm. efficient redu uh, reduction in carbon emissions uh, the and one could make them pretty much equivalent uh, but there's, there's a tendency to to construct the carbon schemes in such a way as to give rights to the people who have been uh, doing the emitting in the past and it seems to me that that's generally not uh, justified. It would be justified if the people who are doing the emitting come from competitive industries that have been only making normal returns on their investments. And there was no way that they could have known that uh, their emissions of carbon dioxide had uh, social costs. And so they, they suffer losses as a result of the imposition of carbon taxes. But I think that uh, anybody who's done any investing over the last 30 years should have known if they didn't know that they were uh, harming the environment and they were getting away with something if they didn't have to pay for it. So on that basis, I would say that the people who have been doing the emitting do not deserve uh, special dispensation in working out how we're going to reduce our carbon emissions. Furthermore, uh, systems of trading depend on quantitative constraints. We decide we can afford a certain amount of carbon and no more and no less. Whereas uh, carbon taxes have prices. And it turns out that uh, if you do things efficiently, the amount of carbon you emit from one year to the next will vary with the economic cycle. You'll uh, emit a lot when conditions are good and emit much less when economic conditions are bad. And it's unreasonable to expect that the people who would be in charge of this would be able to figure out what the right quantity was for any particular time. Now, we have a hard time figuring out what the right price is, but at least we have good reason to believe that whatever the right price is, it's the same from one year to the next. So whatever error we're making, we're uh, not uh, making a large error uh, one year in a small era the next year where uh, we we can uh, confidently say that the price ought to be stable. Now, I've come up with a device for trying to figure out what the right price is. Uh, and that is a futures market of a sort. Well, economists sometimes call it a prediction market. Uh, so uh, he, we have uh, 30 year bonds. So 30 years seems like a good time to think about. So we could take the year 2052, 30 years from now, and say that in the year 2052, we will hold uh, an academic conference at which we'll try to figure out what the price was for 2022. Uh, and if you Are want sure to. You want to go that far out, Nick? <laughs> yes. 
yeah. Given uh, given the the forecast that we have about the impending well, uh, consequences no, no, of current no, policy. No, no uh, let let me explain. Okay. If you want to admit today, you buy a well, you you put up a deposit uh, of something like a hundred dollars a ton for emitting carbon dioxide, something at the upper limit of the economic estimates of what the damages are. Then in 2052, 30 years from now, we make our best guess as to what the price should have been and give the holders of these certificates their change. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, anybody who wants to admit today can sell his receipt to, to anybody else or whatever that person will pay for it. And the market for those receipts gives us today's best estimate of what the estimate will be in 2052 of what the price should have been in 2022. This, it seems to me, is the best device I can come up with for setting a carbon price today. I, I guess my reaction was based on the fact that uh, some of the entities that would be uh, uh, willing to do that may be thinking in that their long term is not that long. In other words, uh, they may not have that long uh, of a of a of a well existence. But people do buy thirty year government bonds, and this is just that's like true. A, yeah, yeah. Even so, today, we still think you know most of us still think we'll be around, or the or the. Where the economy and our society will be around and intact and functioning in 30 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as long as we can sell 30 year government bonds, we can sell 30 year pollution certificate, pollution, pollution Great. refund certificates. Okay. Well, that's, that's something again, thank you for, for giving that to us to ponder and think about and, and maybe you'll get some uh, feedback from some of our viewers and listeners here today. Um, I, I, I guess I would like to, you know, sort of finish up our conversation with, with a rough assessment from you on where you think we are in the, the 18 and a half year cycle that many, uh, quote, Georgists, uh, believe strongly in. And with, if we took it, if you look at 2010, as the trough of the last cycle, then somewhere around 2026, uh, some of our colleagues believe we're going to have the next really serious systemic downturn. And it could be perhaps the most serious we've had since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, it's a subject that I haven't studied. I, I have uh, seen, uh, some of the uh, past work, and it looks impressive to me. I think the year was 2008 rather than 2010. So that when you add 18 years, you do get 2026. And uh, I'd be cautious about being long in the market in 2026. <laughs> okay, good advice. Um, any last S the issues you'd like to bring bring up that we haven't covered that you think would be good for people to know about? No, I can't think of any. Wow. Well, uh, in that event, I, I all I can say is thank you so much for your time and for the insights and the wisdom you shared with us. And I, um, I hope that you know, maybe in a year or so we can revisit and see if see if some of your ideas have, have taken fruit. Uh, so uh, with that, I guess that's uh, it for this edition of Smart Talk. And for more information on this and other episodes, please visit our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. Again, I'm Edward Dodson, and I thank you for watching Smart Talk.